Welcome to the show. It's Ivy Nation Sports Talk. He's Jesse Styers. I'm Sean Styers. Glad to have you here on this Thursday afternoon. We've got plenty to get to today. Plenty of Notre Dame football talk. TD4ND chiming in. Great show with Brian and Notre Dame softball coach Deanna Gumpf today. They were talking about the uh, annual strikeout cancer event that Notre Dame softball has coming up. So I haven't had a chance to uh, uh, listen to that yet, but of course you can always go back either on YouTube or on your podcast platform, whether it's Apple or Spotify or Google, wherever it happens to be, and you'll be able to uh, to find it, to listen to it. Oh, Matt, <laughs> Matt's Matt's coming in with. I had a I had a, a Jayhawk T-shirt on yesterday, so Matt's coming in with uh, with Kansas references. Today, Jess, I saw today, you know, of course, the women's final four is in your town, not your Neck in the town, woods, but the city that you live in now, Cleveland. And I saw Caitlin Clark was was giving Cleveland plenty of props in her press conference earlier today. You see that by any chance? Yeah, I, I think it said something like there's there's an abundance of things to do in Cleveland. And yeah, it's funny because I I was talking, I think maybe on the last podcast about how there's a, these NBA guys and they say that Cleveland, they hate coming to Cleveland. So it was very <laughs> kind of uh, counteractive there, but I think Caitlin must've had some, you know, a good amount of downtime. Cause I remember you saying that they came straight from Albany. So they probably had you know a little bit of time to hang out and maybe go do something, but I don't know what she's done because the weather has been so crappy here the last few days, just cold, yeah, rainy and dark. So Same I, I don't help in. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I might have to ask her like what she's done that's so fun. <laughs> she went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. She said that. Oh. She said that uh, you could you could stay in there for days and still find you know more. You went there. Yeah, we all went there a couple years ago out there when we came out one summer. That was a lot of fun. A lot of cool stuff in there. I mean, there a lot of floors and spent a lot of time in the old Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Well, let's talk some Notre Dame football. We um, got to talk with Notre Dame defensive backs coach Mike Mickens after practice yesterday, and we're going to hear from him on a few topics today. We've got Jaden Greathouse that will lead off rapid fire as well. But, you know, before we get into to some of the things that he talked about, Mickens has been at Notre Dame for four seasons now, which is kind of amazing. It doesn't seem like it's already been that long. But I think it's easy to forget that he actually came to Notre Dame to join Brian Kelly's staff before Marcus Freeman ever even came over. He came over a year before Marcus Freeman came to Notre Dame to become defensive coordinator. So what do you think of of what you've seen of Mickens over these last four years? Yeah, I've really liked some, you know, a lot of the things that I've seen out of Coach Mickens and primarily what obviously the the thing that has been the most um, noticeable is the performance of the cornerbacks. Like I've never felt that Notre Dame has had truly shut down cornerbacks and over the last four seasons under you know Mike Mickens we've started to see that I think you know the first corner that we saw excel under Mike Mickens was Jalen Elliott he ended up going on he's having you know a pretty good career in the NFL and then we saw you know Kyle Hamilton I know it's not a corner but he's still within the secondary and you know going on into the NFL and so and now there's you know Benjamin Morrison a guy who came in his freshman year when he was All-American um, yesterday, I think, or was it yesterday, or a couple of days ago, the Notre Dame football page released that video of Christian Gray, you know, another young corner mm-hmm. that's performing really well. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, I, I, th- I think the thing that I like the most out of Mike Mickens is he's getting the most out of these young guys early. It's not taking a bunch of time, you know, until their junior year, senior year, he's getting these young, talented guys on the field and allowing them to be difference makers. And really, I think that speaks to coaching because if when you're that young as a freshman and sophomore and to have, you know, that sort of impact, it's all because of great coaching and great preparation. And that's all because of Mike Mickens. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you mentioned a couple of names there that were safeties. And I think that that kind of, you know, shows the point because it's primarily been the safeties who have come out of Notre Dame and, and you know, performed well in the NFL here and there, you've seen some corners, but really that's been one of, you know, both from a recruiting standpoint and a developmental standpoint, that has been one of the biggest glaring areas that needed to be addressed for, for Notre Dame in order to actually be able to go out and compete for championships. Could the corners 
match up with elite type wide receivers, you know, whether it's Alabama or Ohio State, Clemson, whoever it happens to be, we've obviously seen issues there over the years. And that that gap has shrunk so much to a point where I don't think that there is a true gap now based on the play that we've seen from the guys in Mike Micken's position group over the last couple of years. They've gone toe to toe with, you know, the likes of, of Ohio State and Clemson and, and some of the other good, you know, USC obviously has elite wide receivers year in and year out, and they've gone toe to toe with those guys as well. So Mike Mickens has closed the gap. You know, we might find out depending on the extent of the Benjamin Morrison injury and what exactly that, you know, means long-term, you know, we might find out even more about the developmental abilities that Mike Mickens has, you know, based on what's left on the roster, you, you've got some, some, again, good young talent coming in, but Benjamin Morrison is still a little bit of an outlier in terms of, relying on a true freshman to come in and perform at that level right away. Morrison was able to do it, but, you know, like you look at a guy like Cam Hart, who was a little bit, you know, now injuries played a part in it, but he was a little bit up and down early in his career. But between getting healthy and I think having Mike Mickens as his position coach, it has turned in turned him into a guy who I think is going to, at the very least, have a very solid NFL career. Yeah, I think you can, without a doubt, say that Mike Mickens, you know, has added a, a significant amount to Cam Hart's, you know, chances of getting drafted. You know, that that combination of them being able to work together. I don't know if we would see Cam Hart excelling at this level had it not been for someone like Mike Mickens. Yeah. And so he has also added now safeties to the uh, to the job title. He's in charge of the entire secondary, not just corners because of Chris O'Leary's departure. Now, as we've talked about, you've got special teams coordinator Mike uh, Marty Biagi, rather, assisting him back there uh, with the safeties. But he's got some help with some junior guys on the staff as well. And this is interesting because some of this stuff has popped up, you know, like we've had people saying, well, you know, does he need a graduate assistant? You know what? You know, like, does he need more help back there? You know, like, why do you? You know, like a lot of people kind of wringing their hands over what's going on and who's helping out Mike Mickens there in the secondary. And so that did come up yesterday. And here's what Mike Mickens had to say about that. Your help, uh, you know, Coach Biagi is uh, helping out as well right. um, back there. And then you got, uh, you know, our GA and our analyst, uh, Casey McHugh and uh, Bryce uh, Dempsey as well. So um, you got a lot back there, a lot of eyes on them. So there's nowhere to hide, I tell them. Nowhere to hide. And I think that that's interesting because, you know, not only do you have Marty Biagi, but he just mentioned, okay, so you actually do have a GA back there, Casey McHugh, and you've got a you know analyst helping out, Bryce Dempsey, as well. So uh, you know, there's, again, there's been a lot of clamor on the champions lounge boards about, you know, does he need to add a GA to help with the secondary? Seems like we can put that to rest though now, huh? Yeah, it does, and and it's interesting that he says, you know, I have I have eyes in the sky, or like I have eyes everywhere because. You know, as a player, that's so crucial because when you're getting feedback, sometimes you can be like, oh, you know, this coach just kind of has it out for me. This coach doesn't like me. But when when everyone, you know, when Biagi, GAs, analysts, Mickens are all giving you the same feedback, it's they're all seeing the same thing. Right. And then and, and then to kind of go into that a little bit further, it, it's everyone's, you know, there's someone always watching. And I think that's what, you know, a, every play is going to be taken into account. So I really liked that. Yeah, decaf asking about Cam Hart. Didn't he come in as a wide receiver? He did come in as a wide receiver and convert it over, just like a guy like, you know, like Kavari Russell. Now, this is obviously pre-pre, but yeah, this goes all the way back to 2012 when Kavari Russell came in at another position and ended up um, playing cornerback as well. And you've had some, you know, like in recent history, Julian Love. Again, this is pre-Mickens. Julian Love, probably the best Notre Dame cornerback, but even he had to switch to safety once he got to the NFL. He's had a, a pretty solid career as a safety, but I think that you know the guys that we have seen, you know, starting with Cam Hart, 
And it just speaks to the development again that that Mike Mickens has, the fact that Hart is performing at the level that he is after coming in as a wide receiver. You know, but we're going to see these guys, we're going to see more and more of these guys go and, and have, you know, even longer, even more productive NFL careers, I think. So I also asked Mickens if there are any disadvantages to coaching the entire secondary rather than just corners like he's done for the last few years. Because, you know, I got great support, right? You know, you got uh, Coach Biaz, you got Coach Golden, you know, you got uh, Bryce Dempsey, and you got uh, Casey McHugh, um, and they help, you know. So, you know, it's like a little team back there that um, that you have to help. So the challenges that you will have, you know, on the field trying to – do two groups you don't really have as much because everybody's on the same page and you know we got we got our own little unit so <laughs> it's been good well you know so again he kind of reiterated all these extra guys that he has on the staff are, are you satisfied with that like it 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 doesn't seem like he is inundated by any means and watching them at practice he's not inundated by any means and like he kind of referred to there like al golden was helping in one of the with the drills that they were doing as well, working with the secondary. So it's 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 far from Mike Mickens back there, you know, in charge of 16 guys, and there's there's nothing else. Yeah, and I, I think uh, the the part I liked the end, or the part I liked the most was what he said at the end. It's we're all one big group now. So it's he's not looking at it as you know I have corners and safeties. It's just another you know big group. It's just another group. It just so happens to be bigger and now he's got more people to sort of you know help him out lean on um and and go through some of these you know defensive drills etc so i really liked him talking about how it's just all we're all one group now you know we're not it's not corners it's not safeties it's you know we're a secondary and then of course if you're working with al golden you're probably working with some of the linebackers and and furthermore it's just i liked that mindset i guess of just you know it's again it's just one group yeah, the specific thing that they were working on yesterday was defending jet sweeps and that kind of stuff. So and it was funny because, you know, Al Golden was was yelling at him. It's like, it's jet sweep. And, it, you know, it's because I, I, it wasn't even seven on seven. It was probably five on five or something like that. You know, he's like yelling at him, you know, that it's, it's, a, it's a jet sweep. And it'll basically, you know, like you got to recognize it. It's like, well, it's kind of a skeleton crew. It's not like they're, you know, yeah. lined up like you know it's a jet sweep, especially considering, you know, sort of the personnel who's on the other side that you, that they were using for those jet sweeps as well, you know, so. Yeah, not <laughs> a lot of hard. jet sweeps going on in seven on seven. Like no. that's, that's usually, you read jet sweep by knowing what the tackle is doing, you know, based on, like they're, they're, they're pass blocking or, you know, they're run blocking. Is that, like that's the clue. And, and I'll, obviously with, it being seven on seven, there's no offensive yeah. linemen out there. Joe, be patient. He's asking how long till Whoa. we lose Coach Mickens. We've got a he's he's got us. You're going to hear from him talking about like looking at other jobs and stuff like that. That's here. not the attitude, Joe. In just a minute. I know it's a little negative. It's a little negative, though. You know, we have a whole on. season to go. Reel it back in. Reel it back in, Joe. <laughs> uh, but we're you know so you just heard Mickens talk about. The disadvantage size. Are there any disadvantages? Didn't really see any disadvantages because he does have such a great staff and support staff helping him and stuff like that. But what about the advantages? That is an advantage, right? Um, the advantage of it is, is you hear one voice, everybody's hearing the same thing, and uh, the communication is always going to be there with it. Uh, so everybody does that. Also, you, you know, it, it grows the knowledge of everybody, right? So now the safety is understand truly what that corner is doing and how he's playing his technique based off of what he's doing. And the same thing, the corner is doing, uh, playing his technique off of what the safety is doing. So it grows the knowledge as football players as well. Um, just being able to hear the whole philosophy, the whole back end, the system of it, um, not just only uh, position specific. Yeah, so we say, you know, the you, Safeties and corners are now together, so it's it's essentially a more holistic approach that he's got going on. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's really nice too when you start running into you know some small nagging injuries as the season goes along. You have guys that you can interchange and work, you know, it maybe from safety and corner or corner to safety or safety to nickel or nickel. You know what I mean? It's just all of those positions become interchangeable when when, like he said, you you. Everyone knows every position. 
and that's the way that best there that's the way that football is going to best function it, defensively is when everyone you know within the secondary at least and linebackers and the defensive linemen you know they all kind of know the different positions in their group because they know you know why we're setting this up how we're setting this up and, and the end goal of who kind of we're funneling the play to right and so it gets you into this you know I don't need to be the star player every time. I just need to do my job. And as long as I do that, I know that, you know, the other corner is going to make the play because that is what this is, you know, designed to do. And and then to kind of go a little bit further, it's just how Al Golden runs his defense. This is how, you know, I over the past few seasons, we've he's talked about how he likes the linebackers to know all the positions and we've seen him be interchangeable. And really that's helped with a lot of guys playing time is being able to know the entirety of the defense, the entirety right. of the positions, because that's going to translate to, you know, better execution essentially. So I like that Mike Mickens group is following suit because I think we've seen nothing but success. And when, you know, when Al Golden has kind of used this approach before. Yeah. And well, well, we'll, we'll get to the nickel talk here in a minute, so I'll save it. But you know, you, when you talk about kind of cross training and learning all the jobs and stuff like that, there is a lot that comes to it. But I mean, it's essentially by the time training camp, rolls around when you include everybody the non-scholarship guys and the scholarship guys like you've got uh Bronte Johnson and Tabron Benny Powell who are going to be coming in in this you know for summer workouts and then during training camp those are a couple of the safeties and then you got Leonard Moore Carson Hobbs a couple of the incoming freshmen you know in terms of the corners who are coming in and then you've also got the Northwestern transfer Rod Hurd the second who can play nickel and safety. So, I mean, you're going to have eight of each, essentially, a total of 16 guys back there. And they might not even look at it as as eight of each, you know, the way he talks about sort of learning everything. And maybe maybe that kind of opens up that that can open up some different opportunities for some of these different guys in terms of now you've got, you know, one guy at kind of at the top of the pyramid, you know, in terms of the uh, the, uh, the the chain of command, if you will, you know, that that kind of thing, you know, to borrow, you know, like military term, you know, but you've got one guy at the top who's seeing all of these guys now. And maybe he sees like a specific skill set in somebody that he thinks can translate, you know, to something else that wasn't being seen before because you were split up into two completely distinctly different groups. Concur? Oh, yeah. Okay. I do concur. All right. So he's also, of course, you know, he's defensive backs coach, passing game coordinator now. And again, you know, like everything under one umbrella, but it is a promotion. And this gets to the question that Joe was asking. He's saying, well, okay, I, I didn't have the original question, but he was asking how long until Notre Dame loses Mike Mickens. And he's saying it's positive because it means they have quality coaches. Okay. So, got to make sure that I've got the right one here. I don't want to replay the uh, the same one here again. So here is Mike Mickens addressing sort of how he is, you know, when when some opportunities maybe present themselves, how he looks at these outside jobs. Well, first thing is uh, I love it here. Uh, I love working for Coach Freeman. I love his culture. I love everything that he represents. I love Notre Dame. I love what Notre Dame represents. Uh, and I love the kids that come here and the mentality that they have. So that's a big piece of if anybody comes after me, I still always think about the pros that are here that are really good with us. Um, and I tell guys who recruit on time, I don't, I'm not just jumping to jump to a job. I'm not that type of guy. It has to be the right fit, the right place for me to ever think about. All right, it got a little, a little, little choppy there at the end. It was starting to pick up. You know, it was a. Uh, a full room full of guys yesterday between some of the safeties and wide receivers and, and stuff like that. But um, he was basically saying, you know, he's not just going to take any job and he loves it here at Notre Dame. And he loves working for Marcus Freeman and the culture that Marcus Freeman has built, you know, so a lot of people, Joe was just asking about it, concerned that Mickens could be moving on soon. Does that, put you at ease? Are you still concerned? Are you more concerned? Are you less concerned? What do you hear 
you know, what do you think when you hear Mike Mickens saying those things? Yeah, I feel like Mike Mickens currently is is like, you know, he's still in that kind of mentorship um, phase. And I think that he's ultimately kind of still learning from someone like Coach Freeman. And you hear how, you know, how he speaks of Coach Freeman. So and, and the thing you have to consider the most is what it would Mike Mickens next step be, right? Like you don't just leave and make a lateral move. Or you don't just leave to leave. And that's kind of, a, you know, what he was getting at there is, I like the things that Notre Dame is. I like the type of players that Notre Dame gets. I like, you know, it's not him leaving to just leave to go somewhere else. It would have to be, you know, I think a defensive coordinator position. I think it would have to be another school like Notre like Dame. Like a big defensive coordinator. Yeah, like he's not going yeah. to like a Mac school to be a defensive coordinator. I think he'd want to be, you know, at a big time school where, it, you know, football is obviously taken seriously. He he is under a coach that he respects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that for those reasons, Mike Mickens will be around for this season. And I think you can comfortably say he'll be around for next season as well. I think you have that, you know, maybe that third season as he continues to grow and get better, as we assume he will, that you would really have to start worrying about is a good defensive coordinator position opening right. up. Well, because look, you know, like when you talk about lateral moves potentially for another coordinator position, when you talk about that kind of move, then I don't think like, especially if Notre Dame is in the playoff this year, then what kind of move makes sense? Uh, what? Well, I guess I'm, you know, like it's not a lateral move. It would still be a step up because he's not a coordinator yet, but I agree with what you're saying about not just this year, but probably next year. Like when you hear, you know, sort of his rationale and his line of thinking, I mean, obviously, the big question is going to be, how long is Al Golden here? Is Al Golden here for the long haul, or does That's Al a, Golden, you know, have have head coaching aspirations still? We don't fully sort of know that because if Al Golden were to move along after next year, Mike Mickens would seem like the perfect fit to get that promotion and, right. and take over as coordinator. But that, you know, that. That could be a career sort of pushing point for Mike Mickens ultimately if if Al Golden, you know, decides that he is completely comfortable and and Mickens is in a situation where he's like, well, you know, it's it's time for my career, you know, to sort of continue to blossom and and move up the ladder. You know, that's that's probably the biggest thing, I think. It, yeah, no one wants to kind of remain constant. You always want to feel like you're moving up kind of you know, the food chain essentially until you're the top of the food tape and you're at the top of the food chain. And so I liked your kind of, you know, pitch there too of, Hey, like maybe not this season or next season, but what if, you know, Al Golan decides to move on and, and, and Mickens is still here and he would be, you know, again, kind of next in line in my opinion and have those years of experience under his belt and then, you know, also just being around Al Golan daily, you know what I mean? Being able to learn how a defense runs right. overall and how not, not only, you know, a defense, but a good defense, uh, a, a dominant defense, a very successful defense. So I, I think Mike Micken still has a little bit of time. I think this talk of, you know, moving on is premature because I don't think he's just going to grab what's ever out there. He's not just going to, you know, latch on to, to whatever bait is out there. It's got to be something that is, you know, really up his alley, I think. Well, and he's, and he's got, you know, like he's working, you know, for Al Golden, who has NFL experience, obviously, who's also been a head coach in college. And like, when you think of the other two, you know, he's already worked for three defensive coordinators at Notre Dame alone because of the fact that he did get here a year before Marcus Freeman. He worked with Clark Lee for a year. He worked under Marcus Freeman as defensive coordinator for a year. And now the last two under... Al Golden, you know, so he's he's had some pretty good coordinators above him and he's learned, you know, I, I have to assume that he's learned a lot of things. And so he's kind of been able to absorb a lot from three pretty good defensive minds, you know, over, over in, in the four years now, four plus years that he's been here at Notre Dame. So he's been able to learn a lot. Joe is asking if that was a one on one. That was not. That was, you know, pool reporter like he sits behind. Uh, a, uh, a counter and uh, you know we all gather around with our recorders and and stuff like that and fire questions away you know so that's 
And that's another part of why, you know, depending on what the recorder is and all that kind of stuff, you know, sometimes the quality is better, sometimes it's worse. But when you got a room full of people, it picks up a lot of uh, external stuff as well. In terms of one on-field specific job duty, I wanted to talk a little bit about the nickel position. You've got Arizona State transfer Jordan Clark at the top of the depth chart there. Micah Bell is working there as well. And here are some thoughts for Mike Mickens on that nickel position. You got Devin Ford as well that okay. uh, is, is learning it as well. Yeah. So you got those guys right there. And then, But my, my philosophy is guys that got to understand multiple positions. So, right. you know, as you saw Christian Gray in the bowl game play nickel, you've seen Jaden Mickey before play nickel. So guys know it just because they don't rep it maybe in practice. They understand what they got to do. So Devin Ford, the former running back who is working at safety, also working at nickel. And again, you kind of heard the philosophy that he's had there in terms of guys getting familiar with different positions and stuff like that. Do you like the philosophy that he's talking about? Yeah, I like the philosophy because as a player, you sometimes like you're not you you go into every play prepared like you know what's going to happen right like it's like taking notes before the exam and studying those notes but sometimes when the exam pops up there's questions maybe that you didn't study or maybe something that's you know kind of throws you off and so when that happens as a player I think it's best to know kind of you know everything else around you because if you're just focused on your job and you're like ah oh, shoot I don't know what happens here you kind of break down right and it can really compromise the defense, but when you have a total understanding of the entire defense, when something like that break, you know, kind of breaks down, you still have the understanding of what you're trying to accomplish and how you can, you know, maybe if you're not specifically making the play yourself, how you can, you know, contribute to someone else around you making the play. So I like I like the philosophy for that reason. I think it allows the player just to be at more ease and be able to just be, you know, less less thinking and more reactionary, just kind of going with the game essentially. Yeah. Joe kind of going back to the Al Golden talk and, you know, where he's going to be. And, you know, he says, don't you think Al is here to retire? He just signed that long extension. I'm not saying this, like, this is why Al, you know, they, they did that with Al Golden, but, you know, and like, this is the ulterior motive, but a lot of times when there is talk about, well, this coach could be moving on, you know, is he going to become a, you know, all the stuff that's going on with Al Golden specifically because you want to go be a head coach. You lock him up for recruiting reasons, if nothing else. Con but contracts are meant to get out of, you know, and especially if it is like if it were the NFL, for example, like it wouldn't be a major issue, you know, like. It just it just wouldn't, you know, so like he can have a contract, he can have a buyout, he can have all those different things. But again, a lot of times. You sign a contract, you know, you give a guy a contract to kind of negate any negative recruiting that might be going on with other schools saying, well, he's only there for a short time. He's going to bounce. He's going to go become a head coach. He's, you know, he's going to go back to the NFL, whatever that, you know, that's why you do that. A lot of times you start, you sign that contract extension to, to try to kind of, you know, squelch some of that kind of stuff. And it definitely does it for the short term. But every contract is going to come up again at some point. You know, there's always going to be a renewal point. So, one final thing recruiting. Oh. Mickens, is, Mickens has done a good job, really good job, of recruiting cornerbacks. But uh, now he's adding safety recruiting to his duties as well because of the fact that uh, he has that position and here's what he said about what he's looking for in terms of the profile of safeties when he's out recruiting to me it's a lot of the same stuff obviously you want them to be a little bit bulkier and be ready to fit a little bit more but i still want them athletic i still want them long i still want them to be able to run to me those are the things right there and also can they process fast right can they process mentally fast because they are running the, the back end of the checks and things of that nature uh, so some uh of that comes into play um do they understand football but you know those things also can be taught a, a lot too so but uh, trait wise athletic long and to run and 
physical? I mean, uh, basically the profile of <laughs> every power five, they're like high yeah, power five that's, you know, guy in the secondary, right? <laughs> we want them fast and we want long, them lanky. Long and fast. <laughs> that's. I think that's every sport. You know what I mean? Like you want length and you want athleticism. But I think ultimately, you know, adding safeties to the overall recruiting duties, I don't think it really shakes anything up because of what we've kind of constantly been talking about the last kind of, you know, 15, 20 minutes in terms of Mike Mickens and his philosophy is he's looking for the same guy ultimately, you know, as his corners. And like he said, it's just someone who's probably beefed up a little bit, right? Especially if it's a strong safety, you want that safety to be able to come down and fill in the alley and make, you know, be able to be, you know, uh, have some contribution in the run game. But ultimately it's, it's just, he's, he's, he's really recruiting the the same type of player, right? It, they're all yeah. kind of fitting the same profile. So uh, I think that maybe the difference one's going to flip his hips a little bit better, right? Yeah. And one's <laughs> just going to be, you know, might be able to put up 225 three or four more times than a cornerback. So I, I think ultimately that's all it is. Right. And he kind of talked about to me, one of the more important parts is how they process the game. Are they, do they have the ability to process the game at a high level and also at a high rate? Like, can you do it on the fly essentially? Yeah. Yeah, TD for D says O'Leary did not recruit well. That was the biggest thing with him. Good, you know, good developer of the guys on the field. See Xavier Watts, but you still got to recruit it. Now the recruiting was getting better toward the end, but I do think that with Mike Mickens running this thing, that that it's it's going to get better there as well because he is such a good recruiter, as we've already seen with the corners. So. I don't think that's going to be an issue as well when you talk about adding those duties, you know, and you will have Marty Biagi, I would imagine, contributing in, in that department as well. So I don't have any concerns there. Jesse, I know you've got a little bit of a time crunch tonight. Are you ready for rapid fire? Let's do this. Okay. Now there are a few questions that I have starred up that I'm going to flip in here that we're going to lead things off with here tonight. Brent, who believes Riley Leonard will be 100% healthy come summer and fall? Do you believe that he will, Jess? I do believe that he will, um, but I can't say that, you know, maybe something in practice or maybe in the first game he might tweak it. You know, I think that in terms of being ready for the first game, sure, but I still think that there is a high – he's just got a more – a higher opportunity to tweak it in some way, right? Like when, you, when, you, when you've heard something, it is obviously compromised, and so – uh, I, I think there is a, a higher rate of re-aggravating it, but I, I think he'll be fine. You know, once the start of the season comes, it's it was very reaffirming to see him out there with that foot brace that he had on because he easily could have. Did you like the fact that he was there though yesterday? Vince and I were both. I would I would safe to say I, I don't know about vehemently, but we were pretty opposed to him being out there as early as he is already, you know, after having that surgery just a couple of weeks ago. No, I don't, I don't mind it because it shows that I think it takes away from the severity or maybe the panic a little bit of, of, you know, Hey, this is the second kind of, you know, thing that's come up with his ankle since getting to Notre Dame. And so for me, it, it kind of simmers that a little bit. I think him okay. getting out there is good. It's like good PR. It's like, Hey, he's got a brace on, he's rehabbing, he's getting it stronger um, it, it's not as a big deal as, you know, maybe what it's made out to it, be. It's good PR, but if he trips in the turf or someone accidentally trips over him or he accidentally trips over somebody else, that's not going to do anybody any good after having a plate <laughs> replaced. In yeah. But again, foot. I still think so, that that shows the confidence that it, that he's good. Man. Like they don't, they're not, they're not doubtful or they're not like weary of something like that happening. At least me, I, I guess I'm more glass half full in this situation you guys sure. are glass you know half empty half yeah empty. <laughs> i think he'll definitely be fine by the summer as long as he doesn't do you know and they don't do something stupid and try to push him too much you know any more this spring it's one thing because he wasn't doing everything that everybody else was doing and he wasn't wearing pads you know he did have right. on his red jersey limited. his pants and he had on a different kind of shoe than everybody else even he was just you know, throwing some passes and stuff out there. But to me, it just, it still seems a little bit early. I think I'll be fine for the summer and for training camp, but it's still like, this is the plant leg and you've got a history in that entire lower part of the leg and into the foot now, you know? So 
I'm not like as much as I, you know, obviously want him to be able to stay healthy. It is football. And all it takes is one little thing. And every time the guy gets tackled, I think everybody's going to be wincing a little <laughs> bit, wondering, you Hold know, is breath. he going to get up? Yeah. And as soon as you see him limp a little bit, like remember when Sam Hartman limped a little bit and everybody thought, oh, he had an injury there when that happened, and you know, whatever else. It's like, it's football, but when you start off with that kind of injury that he's already had, it's, it's just, man, I think that there's reason for concern. I want to sneak in my own little side question here before okay. we get into this uh, this, yeah, this first segmented rapid fire question. Did you see the Max Bola video um, of him I going did. through those drills with the linebackers? I did. Have you seen him do that live at practice? Is he um, that intense all the time? <laughs> I loved it. That guy is basically out there practicing as a linebacker. Yeah, I mean, we, I don't think we've got to see the full Max Bola when we've been there so far, maybe at the first practice, they saw more of that, that I wasn't at, but I think we get another full practice here coming up uh, like a week from Saturday or something like get that. Get there early so, for some individual drills. Yeah. Did you like that chest pad? Thing yeah. That's my favorite one where he, they absorbing were just the hits. Getting into, yeah. No, but the, for real though, the reason why I like that so much is as a player, like you have more trust in what you're like, if your coach can give you a rep like that, you know what I mean? Like that's such a, a game like a, a, a much closer game rep and that intensity like he just you just know he's like out there for you he wants you to get better and, and so to to give that rep and to have that intensity constantly I'm just fired up for how these linebackers are going to play this season. I mean when you think about it it's a very physically fit staff right? yeah like I was like he looks like he could still be out there yes he does I mean and he, he was just in the NFL not that long ago and you know like they're there are no Mike McCarthy's on this staff. Let's put it that way. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I have full confidence that they could go out there and run some gassers if they needed to. You know, what's so. my favorite part of that video though, is KVA being such a freshman and bringing that water bottle to them as they're switching drills. Like that is a, that is a brownie points move. If I've ever <laughs> seen one, Hey coach, I know you must be tired going through those drills with us. Here's a little water bottle as we, <laughs> yeah, as we right. run off. I thought that was great. Yeah, that's right. I thought it was as well. Good stuff. Okay. Now the moment Salty's been waiting for. Jaden Greathouse. <laughs> we got to talk to him yesterday as well. And, of course, hot topic of conversation, or at least a topic that came up anyway, the impact of his new wide receivers coach, Mike Brown. So have a listen. The great one, Jaden Greathouse. Um, playing fast, just not thinking too much when I'm out there on the field. You know, we have a lot of things to think about uh, as wide receivers, whether people believe it or not. But <laughs> it's not just go catch the ball. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so we definitely can get caught up in thinking too much sometimes, and that kind of plays uh, forces us to like slow down our play. But just as long as we're playing fast, all the other things will come because we know what we're trying to do. So as long as we're playing fast, everything will come. The technique will be good, and we'll be able to dominate. So what's the most important thing you heard there? From the great one, Jaden Greathouse. Yeah, playing fast. And I think that, you know, playing fast, and to me, he was kind of hinting at something. And I'll say what I thought he was hinting at. You know, okay. When you have a previous coach, and obviously there are the, the relationships with everyone in that room weren't great with said coach, there's always the thought process of if I'm out here not doing what I'm supposed to do for a coach that already doesn't like me, there is already the pressure to kind of perform a little bit bit better and when you're thinking about that you're just not going to play fast you're like not going to play get, fast you're going to get yanked if you're not doing yeah exactly whatever. you're just going to get exactly pulled right. out because coach already hates me right. and if i mess up on the smallest thing then i'm going to get pulled out and so not having to worry about that and just being able to play more free and fast and have that you know tr uh, knowing that you're, you're you have more trust from your coaches that's kind of my biggest takeaway no, I, I completely agree with all of that. And maybe it's just that little bit of hesitate. You know, I don't think it was just that. There were other issues as well. Oh, yeah. I think that, that that definitely was a factor in the lack of production that we saw at this position last year. And the fact that it, it seems like everyone's on the same page now and just what he talked about, the ability to sort of be unleashed and the ability to just go out there and play. I think that's going to be huge for these guys. Something that that 
you know, again, like maybe you just kind of take for granted, but I think it's 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 ultimately going to be a big thing for them. It sounds minor, but it's it's just right. guys perform best when they're just out yeah. there having fun. Just more normalcy. Yeah, I think. I think that that is a big thing after, you know, whatever sort of chaos was going on in that room last year and just different kind of focus on details in those kind of things, which we've talked about as well. So here's more from Jaden Greathouse on the impact of Mike Brown. I think it's been great for the whole group. You know, obviously it's a struggle when you get a new coach towards the end of the season, during the season, um, bull prep, all those kinds of things. Um, It can definitely be an adjustment for sure, but I think we welcomed him just as much as he welcomed us. And um, we've just been trying to take his guidance as, as much as we can and really just learn as much as we can from him and that's definitely why I think uh, the group has just steadily improved day in and day out since since the last year uh, the group has made tremendous strides uh, everybody in the whole room so it's definitely been a fun thing to watch um, it's been really cool just to see everybody progress and you know we're still not done all right Jess so there's Jaden Greathouse everybody in the room has made big strides scale of <laughs> one to ten how confident are you that Notre Dame's receivers are actually going to be noticeably improved this season? You know, I'm going to give this an 8 out of 10 because it's not only Mike Brown, but it's it's the combination of Mike Brown in the Mike Denbrock offense. I think that you're going to see, you know, more creativity out of the offensive coordinator, uh, you know, scheming guys open a bit better. And I think you're ultimately going to see more fundamentals being taught by the wide receiver coach himself. And so when you add those two things together, I think you're visibly going to see wide receivers out there just playing, you know, doing what they do best, getting getting the ball in open space and and, and really just kind of dominating. So it's it's just really good to hear. And and then for you know Jaden Greathouse to say that you know we are strides better. I just imagine that has to be so refreshing when you have a coach that is eager to come in and teach you and make you better. And then coming off of what this group th- went through last year, they obviously are very eager to have a new, you know, a, a new voice essentially that they're listening to. And I think, you know, to me, the the thing that stuck out the most in that one was Jaden Greathouse sounded like someone who was very eager um, for the opportunity to kind of absorb information from someone else to be able to actually better his game, right? And so I think I think that's across the board. That's not just Jaden Greathouse, just. I think everyone is eager to to learn more and just be better overall. I'll be curious to see kind of the careers of the guys who left and uh, how they end up at their at their new spots and kind of how that all pans out for them. Because as we've seen before, guys who we thought were really going to be something have not necessarily gone on and and done anything else, you know, after they have left here um, to answer this question. I think I'm in an eight as well. And I kind of went back and forth because there's, there's just a little bit of hesitancy and maybe I'm buying in too much. I mean, you're pretty convinced other people are even more convinced than me, but just watching these guys, like you, you watch Mike, Micah Gilbert, you know, who's another, you know, freshman who's come in and been really impressive so far with some of the stuff that he's been able to do. Like Chris Mitchell has been impressive. Jaden Greathouse, again, you know, like with the, he just looking more healthy. And I was looking at some photos like from last year's training camp and just kind of, you know, what he looks like this year and just the overall physical development that he's had. And then you see that applied on the field with some of the things that he's doing on the field with his hands, with his feet, you know, the explosiveness and those different things. I think this is going to be just a lot more locked in looking wide receiving group this year. And they're obviously going to have a new quarterback. And as you mentioned, they've got an offensive coordinator who I think, as you referenced there, is just going to unlock more. Yeah. He's going to be able to take advantage of a lot of different things. I don't think that Notre Dame's offense has taken advantage of space nearly the way they've needed to the last few years with athletes like now, granted, they haven't necessarily had, you know, this complete level of athlete across the board, but I think they're going to be able to take advantage between the combination of the bodies that they have and the guy who's pulling the strings. Now, I think they're going to be able to do a lot more. This is why we should be so like, this is the most exciting year for Notre Dame football in a while, just because 
you know, it starts with Marcus Freeman, the way he's been able to change and establish a different culture, now bringing in sort of the pieces of the puzzle that he wants. And then, and, and then, and the pieces of the puzzles are, are coaches, but to me, more importantly, players, the type of recruits that like, we are starting to see Marcus Freeman recruits on the field. You know, these true freshmen, sophomores, like these are the guys that we're seeing that can compete. I think athletically, you know, with the Clemson's, the Georgia's, et cetera, it is, and that goes back to what you're saying, being able to get your athletes in space and have the athleticism to compete with the Alabama's, the Georgia's, you know, Clemson's, Ohio State, whoever it might be, that this is the, the smallest I think I've seen that gap. And then when you add someone like Denbrock, he's the guy that ultimately is, is to me, the final piece of the puzzle. Well, he's the guy that gets gets these players open. He is going to scheme them open. That's the direction I thought they were going to go after the Alabama playoff loss. Yeah, because you could just tell they were outmatched in, right. in terms of speed. But that's not the direction that BK went. And, you know, obviously you had Tommy Reese connected to that in his year as offensive coordinator under Marcus Freeman. And then you had Jared Parker connected to that because he was under Tommy Reese and they didn't come in and just completely overhaul the offense still put up a lot of points, as we know, but they didn't necessarily do that either. Now I think you've got a completely you've got a complete reset with Mike Denbrock coming in and giving them this kind of offense. So I think they're like, but with I think all those points, finally did you ever that. feel like in a conference that he's in, they're used to that. You know, sorry, go ahead. With all those points that everyone loves to throw that stat around. Oh, this team has scored the most points ever. Did you ever feel like Notre Dame's offense was truly dominant or that you could rely on them in the big game? Unfortunately, no. I mean, so what's it matter with all these points if you don't have an offense that can right. go toe to toe when it matters the most? Right. So you're saying their offense is like Dak Prescott, basically. Yeah. I mean, that's the comparison <laughs> a lot of people make is just absorbing some of that junk time. You know what I mean? The, those junk stats, essentially. Yeah. Just for DK. I did that just for DK, by the way, because I saw a comment of his lingering there in the chat. Paul says, so now it's CSPTSD. Coach Chancy or uh, Chancy Stucky PTSD, basically. I mean, I mean, if the PTSD fits, <laughs> you must have quit, I guess. Craig says his confidence. That's is where I'm at, too. Showing. You can never be a 10 without someone showing you something. That's right. That's right. Got to see it. Got to see at least a little. And that's why I'm at eight. It might, might, might even be a little like seven and a half might be yeah. more true. Eight Show seems it to a little me. high to me. Yeah. Give me the touchdowns. Yep. So Bobby was saying earlier, he says, I'm just going to ask the chat. Do you believe in Riley Leonard? And if this offense with better wide receivers this year in the running back room, we have with two healthy tight ends, will this offense be, I think he's saying top five, 10. So do you think this offense will be top five or 10 in the nation? Jess? No, I don't think they're going to be top five, 10 in the nation, but I don't think they have to be that high in the nation. I think with the combination that they have defensively or what we anticipate, you know, what they're going to be defensively, you know, given what we saw last year and then sort of building off of that for this season, I, I don't they don't need to be like the most elite offense in the country, nor do I think they're going to be. I just think they need to be able to, like I said, when, when the defense does its job in big games, like like, for example, I think the best thing I can think of is that that at the end of Clemson on the road, defense is making stop after stop. And, and it just felt like, you know, Notre Dame just kept going three and out, three and out, three and out, three and out. They just need to be able to score in those type of situations. You know, that's that's really ultimately I'm looking for is being able, you know, to reward the defense for their efforts and be able to, you know, again, I don't think they're going to be this offense that, you know, just puts up massive numbers and blows people out. They're going to score, but they just need to be able to score when it matters the most. And I think that's what, you know, that's that's kind of the thing obviously because what I just said that they've been missing is just scoring when, when they need it the most. That's when it's, yeah, exactly. Can, can they, can they score in those situations like they were in against, you know, Ohio state, Louisville and Clemson yeah. last year, because the offense looked completely different. The only time they did it was against Duke and yeah. it took a, a fourth and long quarterback scramble yeah. job got done, 
But that needed to be done in all the other games too. That's a national championship offense, an offense that responds or gets it done in the crucial moments. That's what's going to win you the crucial games. Yeah, Brent, Brent was asking how good of a coach Mike Brown is. You know, look, he had a pretty good history at Cincinnati. He was obviously on a staff that went to a college football playoff. You know, he and you know, he went to Wisconsin before he ended up here so you know with Luke Fickle so Marcus Freeman has trust in him and I think that I trust that based on the decisions that we've seen Marcus Freeman made make so far I think you know because one of the things is it's not just development but it's also recruiting we heard that from the beginning right and so I think that that is not, I think it is a big part of the deal when you're a college coach. It's not just what you can do on the field. You know, like people knocking Chris O'Leary again, Chris O'Leary, good guy, good developer on the field, was getting better as a recruiter, probably had to be pushed a little bit, you know, to work some things as a recruiter and helped out a little bit. But that was still, you know, sort of the, you know, the downside to Chris O'Leary. And I think that recruiting is going to be part of the deal. And this roster is going to look drastically, continue to look drastically different here in a couple of years. I think, you know, cause Stucky was a good recruiter as well, but as we saw that kind of, you know, things blew up for other reasons, other than just being a good recruiter, there has to be the total package. And I think based on what Marcus Freeman saw was going on here and based on the work that he did with Mike Brown in Cincinnati, he knew what he was getting, and that's why he's here. Yeah, I mean, listen, when it, Mike, I know Mike Brown is a good coach because he started his coaching career in 2016, and, and from 2016 to present, he's only been at one stop more than one year. You don't bounce around and continue to get promotion of, you know, wide receiver coach, and now you're passing game coordinator and wide receiver coach. Now you're associate head coach and wide receiver coach. You don't continue to bounce around and take, you know, these jobs unless you're in demand and then you're in demand if you're doing something good. And so that's all I need to know or that's all I need to see, really. Bobby also wants to know if Kingston Villamu, Villamu Asa is going to be. I have to uh, practice saying that name. KVA is going to play this year. He says he, he doesn't see a red shirt. We talked a little bit about him yesterday. I think he's going to be this year's Drake Bowen. He's going to be on all the special yes. teams. He's going to get, you know, Bowen will be the primary Mike linebacker and KVA when the situations present themselves, you know, we'll be able to get some actual game reps playing linebacker. There's no reason he's to the nickel you know, linebacker. Yeah. Might, you know, could, could end up happening for sure, but he's going to be all over the special teams. I think, you know, like I said, I think it'll be this year's Drake Bowen. So he's going to see the field quite a bit. All right, shifting gears a little bit. The Athletic pulled nearly 100 women's college basketball players and asked them who the biggest trash talkers they faced are. Here's the vote. Angel Reese from LSU led the vote with 20. Cameron Brink from Stanford, this surprised me a little bit, got 12 votes. She came in second. Caitlin Clark with eight votes came in third. Now, fill in the blank. It's blank. That Hannah Hidalgo tied for fourth place in this poll with Arizona's Jada Williams with four votes. It's great that Hannah Hidalgo uh, got tied for fourth because you know why? There is nothing more that I want than a trash talking guard that is going <laughs> to press you and guard you and try to take the ball away from you. You know who also was a, a you know a real big trash talker, played great defense, Kobe Bryant. You know what I mean? Like Kobe Bryant. Michael Jordan, name all the great basketball players. They're they are so intense that they you know they Reggie get in that Miller. game mode. Reggie Miller, especially at the guard position, right? Like you, it is almost mano y mano. And so when you when you're talking about you know someone that you want to run your team and and you know Hannah Hidalgo being the, the defensive player that she was, leading the nation in still steals, leading the, the the nation in defensive you know win share stuff like that. Like I expect that sort of stuff. I think that's great because I think that's what it takes to be a great defensive player. You have to be in such a mindset that I am going to lock you down and I'm also going to stomp you while you're down. You know what I right. mean? It's, it's that killer instinct. And I've got to be honest when I, you know, I saw this story and I pull up, I open up the athletic app and I'm scrolling and I see this story, you know, about the, the biggest trash talkers in women's college basketball. And when I went to the story, 
I was going to be really disappointed if I didn't see Hannah Hidalgo's name. That's what I mean. You know? If you're a pesky defensive person, you talk a lot of crap. Yes. Yes. And I mean, that's her personality. And she, you know, just like Caitlin Clark, she feeds off that kind yes. of stuff, you know? And again, I was a little surprised to see Cameron Brink because you just, you know, look at her, you know, like, and that's not sort of, I think, what you would expect, you know, from the big, you know, Stanford, yeah. uh, Cameron Brink. Oh, but, I know who Cameron Brink is. Yeah. But, you know, but, but so I think it's awesome that Hannah Hidalgo's on there. Also interesting that Louisville's entire roster <laughs> got three a vote. votes, got three votes. They said uh, well, they all talk. That. Everybody at Louisville talks, apparently. And you know like, that. They said they talk. Oh, I mean, it's like when Van Lith was, I think there, it was, it was even horrible. Worse. Yeah, I think it was even worse last year when Van Lith was still there. I think their coach contributes. Oh, he does. I mean, look at his personality. <laughs> That's what I mean. And you know that he contributes to it. Like <laughs> that whole, I can't even imagine being in that locker room. Yeah. It's just like, does, it, does anybody ever shut up is what it feels like. You know? The only thing that, the other thing I took away from this is I really, like this, this really, I didn't want to get into the, the you know, the Angel Reese stuff. But you can't cry wolf when people say you're the biggest trash talker. Right. That's that's my overall kind of comment on that as well. Yeah. Then that's all I'm going to say about that one. Yeah. I mean, you can't go from the wolf to the sheep, basically. That's what I mean. You can't be that bold when things are going well. You can't and be the, play the victim the, card as soon as yes. you know, one thing goes wrong. You can't I'm be sorry. the big, big bad dog barking all season. And then when you get when you when you finally lose, be, oh, you know, poor me. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, TD four and D wants to know if Kim Mulkey made an honorable mention. I mean, <laughs> let's be honest, Kim Mulkey and Jeff Walls, LSU and Louisville would, you know, would have to be the top two coaches, you know, who would show up on the list, I think, but it's gotta be Vince, right? Yeah. She was voted. She was. Oh yeah. Vince is definitely the biggest <laughs> trash talker on the IV staff. I mean, that guy, any chance he gets, man, he is. <laughs> Throwing it out there. VD21. Can't wait. Can't wait. Mulkey was voted the coach that players would least like to play for. <laughs> on, the, on the same day, Van Lith transferred after that's one right. season. And that's interesting. You know, Haley Van Lith is back in the portal. After going to Louisville or, or leaving Louisville to go to LSU, she's back in the portal. Her scoring went from 19.7 a game to 11.6. Her assist stayed about the same. She just... She just didn't look – I think I said it the other day. She got worse, and LSU got worse with her addition. Yeah. You wouldn't have thought that that would happen as good as she was. But I just think that there was – you know, she basically became the third fiddle down there at LSU, and I just don't think it was the right fit. So it'll be interesting to see where Haley Van Lith ends up. Now, I wonder, like, could she end up at – Kentucky, the Virginia Tech, former Virginia Tech coach. I don't know if you saw this, but we talked about it a little bit yesterday. Kenny Brooks, the Virginia Tech coach, is at Kentucky now. And Megan Duffy, who was at Marquette, is now at Virginia Tech. So that's going to kind of change now some Notre Dame gets to play her ECC dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. So that'll be really interesting. Okay. Here's a NFL question for you jess if andy reed the kansas city chiefs head coach is the best current nfl head coach who is number two and we're talking current coaches only um my pool of three off the top of my head would be sean mcveigh mike mcdaniels and mike tomlin i could i think that's the three that i would you know dwindle it down to and then from there See, this one's hard because they're all – like the guys I just named, they're all different – Good, they're, they're all good for different reasons. Like Mike Tomlin, incredibly consistent. I think he does a lot with not a lot. You know what I mean? I think he gets the most out of his teams. Yeah. I think Sean McVay is the, the mind I respect the most. The And and then, you know, his, just his overall ability to scheme offensively I respect. Um, and then Mike McDaniels, I really like, again, his offensive scheme. But I like the way that he connects with his players. And the way that his players, you know, would like to play for him, but he just doesn't have any proven success. McVeigh has a Super Bowl. Uh, Mike Tomlin has a Super Bowl, and so that's, you know, I, I have to get rid of McDaniel's because he's just too young right now. And so for me, I, it's either Tomlin or or McVeigh. Um, and I, I think I'd have to go. Mc, I'd lean McVeigh because I don't think Tomlin is as current when it comes to kind of offensive 
you know, scheming, game planning, all all the above. Right. I mean, the thing that Tomlin obviously has is the track record. He's got, right. you know, and he is he is actually tied for 11th all time with 173 wins. Reed is fourth all time right now um, with 258 wins. Interesting, Mike McCarthy, 17th. All time, 167 wins, and of course he's got a Super Bowl, which is crazy. But you've got John Harbaugh, Sean Payton, McVay, Tomlin, um, and uh, Doug Peterson are the only. You know, those are all the active coaches that have a Super Bowl win to their credit. I went back and forth on McVay and Tomlin, and Tomlin. <laughs> so we had the same. We literally got down to the same. That's yes. insane. Yes. Because Tomlin has, you know, the record like 17 consecutive non-losing seasons, and they he did just get to the freaking playoffs with Kenny Pickett. That's what I mean. You the know, man just like, finds a way. They yeah. don't have losing seasons, right? And like McVay, they would be a lot better. Like they were better at the end of this past season. They would be better in the, these past couple of years post Super Bowl, but they essentially cashed in all their chips to win a Super Bowl. Yeah. Out there. They knew and that. They traded away all those first round draft picks. And so their their roster is just not what it should be in terms of being able But wouldn't you to make that, that same decision? Oh, I absolutely would. And so that's why it's kind of hard to evaluate McVay because he's been doing it for such a shorter amount of time than a guy like Tomlin. So I think I would nudge Tomlin. I would put Tomlin at number two and McVay at number three just because he doesn't have the track record yet. Nice. Yeah. Scale of one to 10. What's your interest in the Indiana state Seton hall NIT championship game tonight? Um, <laughs> to be honest, zero out of 10. I didn't even know the NIT championship <laughs> was tonight. I got a, you know, I, I told you I have plans after this to go see uh, a buddy for his birthday. I'm sure we're going to a sports bar, so I'm sure it's going to be on. Um, I'm just interested because I wanted Indiana state to make it. And so when you win the NIT, you basically give the middle finger to the to the NCAA committee and say, hey, we, we should have been in this thing. You know, like we were one of the better teams. And so I'm rooting for Indiana State and my big that the big man with the goggles uh that that is that is also on their team. I enjoy watching him play. Yes. Robbie Avila is uh the guy you're talking about. I will just say this. A couple of nights ago, NIT semifinals. I made a couple modest wagers. <laughs> I put together on the overs, right? Modest part. I actually did two. I forgot that I did two. I, I had Seton Hall and Indiana State. I parlayed them together, money lines. They both won. Then I did the overs for uh, for those game. You know, for for both of those games as well, and that one. So I'm on a four. I'm on a four uh -oh. parlay streak right now, or a four four wager streak that I've got going that I've actually won. So my interest in tonight's NIT championship game is solely from a wagering standpoint. Isn't that Again, what's so great about wagering? I know. And that's what makes you know, <laughs> the NIT. You know, it's like, oh, NIT, whatever. But I've got – so I did like some point, you know, like will they get to, you know, 15, 20 points, a couple guys for Seton Hall and and uh, Avila for, uh, for Indiana State. And I've got the over on tonight's game as well. It was only like 158 or something. Yeah. Like that, and they've both been averaging like well over 80 points a game. You lucky so, duck. I don't know if I told you this, but they took away college props from Ohio, so I can only bet on over unders and money. Lines. Louisiana, I think, is uh sounding like they're going to be the next in line to do it. You know what that means? Next Notre Dame college football season, you're just going to be my bookie. <laughs> you might be right about that. Um, TD4ND. No Maddie Westbelt news. Still waiting for an announcement. Haven't heard anything. The draft is April 15th. And the deadline to apply for the draft was Monday. So she knows what she's going to do. It's just a matter of when she's going to announce it. DK says he'd rather watch beat Bobby Flay than the NIT championship. Tough, tough. Well, he won't be that interested in this next question because the final four, they've been playing it at Hinkle Field. I didn't even realize the final four for the NIT was at Hinkle Fieldhouse this year, including tonight's championship down in Indianapolis. It was in Nevada <laughs> last year. Of course, the NIT final four had been at Madison Square Garden for a long time. 
Should they move it back to New York permanently, or should they just keep rotating it like they do with you know the regular March Madness NCAA Final Four? Yeah, I like the idea of rotating it, especially if you're the NIT, because I think you have to find a way to hit different markets and grow diff- you know different ways of attention, eyeballs, etc. And so I think the more you can move it around, it's more of like, oh, I'm in Phoenix and I don't have anything to do on this random night. Let's go out and watch, you know, an NIT game. I think the more you can move it to cities like that, I think you're going to get a great crowd. But when you consistently put it in the same spot, everyone's like, ah, it's just the NIT again, right? Like when you introduce it to new areas, those people are excited because even if it's the NIT, they've never seen it before. And again, it's something to go do and have a good time probably you know, at a reasonable price as compared to probably a professional sports game, yeah. the NCAA tournament. You know what I mean? It's just – I think it's just a better fan experience in terms of not just, you know, draining your wallet. <laughs> I, yeah, I say move it around and maybe even just move it to some places that traditionally haven't gotten Final Fours or yeah. aren't getting Final Fours. Like Kansas City would be a good place, for example. They've got a nice arena there in Kansas City. That it that's not big enough, you know. They don't have a domed stadium, obviously. So, like the NIT championship would be good there. Maybe put it out in Denver, you know, Salt Lake City, some different places like that. Move it around, like you said, you know, like people like TD was saying, who cares? I mean, theoretically, yeah. But I think I think you brought up the best point is if you actually want exposure for the NIT, moving it around and giving some of these different places the chance to get it and see some of these teams that they don't typically get to see. And it's a, you know, it's a final four situation still. I think that's the best way to do it. All right. We got time for one more fill in the blank. It's blank that Sutter health park in West Sacramento, California is going to host the Oakland A's for three seasons beginning next year before the team moves to Las Vegas in 2028. It's incredibly sad in my opinion, because I saw something today. Originally, you know, I was like, ah, who cares? The A's will do better in Vegas, right? Like the, the numbers will go up. The A, like a, anything's going to thrive in Vegas. It's Vegas. They've done football. <laughs> they've done hockey now. You know what I mean? It, it's going to work. But the part that really got me is imagine me as a Cubs fan and a team gets ripped out of my city. And now uh, me as a fan, I'm left there with nothing. And it's not like the A's. You know, everyone wants to laugh about the A's probably the last, you know, 10, 20 years. But the A's were good back in the day, right? They have a lot of history behind them. And so when I saw a guy today post on X, hey, I'm I'm giving up my fandom. He's, he basically was like, I've been an A's fan for 40 years. I've never switched. The Giants have been around the corner. The Dodgers around the corner. He said, I'm officially done with them. And he took a picture of himself in a Shohei Otani jersey. Like, that would be heartbreaking to me. Like, I couldn't imagine losing my team like the Cubs – to another city and now we're going to go to a dingy you know park that holds like four thousand people that's what you think of this major league team i just i and and ultimately too it's just a bad look on the mlb how are if you're the rest of the you know it's a bad look on rob manfred that's what i mean like if but it's it's just like it's horrible it's 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 every team it's not it's not just the teams that everyone loves like the yankees or the cubs or the red it's every team your whole MLB organization doesn't look good when something like this happens and you can't step up to help the A's because obviously it's a bad situation, but no one's doing anything to fix it. And so now we're going to watch a professional right. sports team play in a, a stadium that holds 4,000 yeah. people. And I've heard people say, well, it's, a, you know, people weren't showing up to see, like they were in the playoffs for a long time. And it's not that people didn't show up to see it it's the the stadium was completely outdated it's the same reason the raiders moved to las vegas they needed a new stadium you make money off the stadium and selling the suites and they needed a smaller stadium for a better environment to give the fans actually something to go to but the you know the the city of oakland itself was never interested in helping out and the fact now that oakland has lost you know even though the Golden State Warriors have just gone across the bay to San Francisco. They still moved out of Oakland. Like all those, all three of those teams, the Warriors, the Raiders, and the A's were all essentially in the same complex next to each other. And now it's all going to be gone. And the fact that these those other two teams had already left and Major League Baseball had a chance to really capitalize on that and keep that market. And, you know, like, again, it's a huge stain on on Rob Manfred. 
that he let this happen. And, you know, there was some negotiating and the city got greedy with what they wanted because there was like an out fee of like 97 million bucks or something like that, that they were going to make the A's pay compared to, you know, like right now the exit fee was something like $1.7 million or something like that. They've needed a stadium for a long time. The city of Oakland has never been willing to step up and help them. And that's, you know, that's why Major League Baseball needed to get involved much more than they did. And yeah. so so now they're going to play in, in a triple-A park in Sacramento. I don't know if they're going to call them the Sacramento A's or what they're exactly going to call them. But it's like this is a – it's an organization that's won championships. And despite the fact that they did play with, with payroll, you know, um, obstacles, they were in the playoffs a lot under yeah. Billy Bean. You know, so. They just don't care anymore. No. Nope. It's sad. No, nope. it's very sad. But it's a vagabond organization from Philadelphia to Kansas City to Oakland and now apparently Sacramento and Las Vegas. And the Las Vegas thing isn't even a done deal. Like that could still fall through because yeah. they're still trying to get that stadium thing figured out. Yeah, Ed says Oakland is a terrible city falling apart. You know, I can't completely disagree with that. My sister used to live out there in that area, but you know, look look what other cities are doing with stadiums and you know, like look what South Bend has even done with a minor league ballpark and what they've done to redevelop that whole area. And like baseball, minor league baseball has really played a big part in helping revitalize the downtown area here in South Bend. So I think Oakland could have done something like that if they had been willing, but they're just not willing to. Yeah. Decaf says four wins field hundred times better in South Bend than they are single A Cubs. All right. Well, again, Jesse's got to get rolling. So we will wrap things up with that. We will be back with the three man rapid fire show. You'll, you'll be here tomorrow, right? Um, Potentially. <laughs> there's a lot going on tomorrow okay there's a lot we have people coming into town all right i gotta take someone to the airport at some point oh I just... here we go here we okay. go the excuses okay. are coming okay. the excuses are coming all right hit the like button on your way out we do appreciate you of course subscribe rate and review and listen scotchy scotch are you a scotch guy jesse no not as much i just stick... not a scotch just just whiskey all right we will talk to you tomorrow, the Rapid Fire Show at 5 o'clock. At least two of us will be here, Ivy Nation Sports Talk.